in a world where there's so much chaos and so much division. So many people think that they have, Lord, we realize that you are on the throne. And because you are on the throne, we do not cower in fear today. Though the media would propagate fear all around us, we rest assured that we know in whom we have believed. And we are persuaded that he's able to keep everything that we've committed unto him against that day. We are convinced in our heart if God be for us, who can be against us, as we sang a few minutes ago. Thank you, Father, for the hope that we have in you, the peace that is ours because you reign on the throne tonight. And Lord, as we are in this time of worship together and a time of word, we pray for members of our family this evening in desperate need of your healing touch. Thank you for touching Gail. Lord, I pray that you touch Michael Slayton, God, that you bring healing power to his body. And Lord, continue to minister to Ann Rouse tonight that she would experience your grace in, in a beautiful way. And, and Lord, uh, Eugenia and uh, many others, we just thank you that your arm is not too short, but it can reach. You have all power. You're our healer. And by your stripes, we were healed. As we go into the word, we thank you that you have given to us an ear to hear. We have a heart that says, yes, Lord, whatever it is you want us to know what you want us to do, we're ready to say, here we are. As we just sang, Lord, I surrender to you. I give all of who I am to be an instrument in your hand. Thank you, Father, for hearing our cry tonight and being in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remind you that the schedule remains the same. We're still in phase one. Pray for phase two to come, which means you need to pray for the COVID to stop and uh, get back to a, a more normal schedule than we have been on the last several months. So on Sunday morning, 8.15 and 11 o'clock, here in the house and live streaming again, and we're looking forward to the blessing of the Lord. And Tony's ready to share the word on Wednesday night. Here we go. All right. Last Wednesday night, we uh, finished up our study from First Peter. And if you have been around much on Wednesday nights over the past several years, you know my normal um, approach when I'm between um, a series is to visit the Psalms. It's uh, something that I return to frequently just because in the Psalms we find the people of God not just expressing uh, their thoughts, but people who read the Psalms often because we think and feel all day long, every day, and it's good to be aware of how the people of God in Scripture thought and felt about the things that they encountered and experienced just in everyday life. Tonight I'm going to It'll be probably a few weeks where I just visit some psalms as I'm preparing for the next series. But uh, tonight I wanted to visit one um, for a very specific reason. Um, I want to visit Psalm 91. In mind, if you want to take a nap right now or if you are tuning in at some point online and uh, you got other things to do, you could just listen to Dad's prayer from a moment ago because... He basically summarized what we're going to learn from this psalm. I've taught out of this psalm more than once, um, but it's an important thing to revisit because there's not a person alive who doesn't encounter or struggle with fears of one sort or another. And it can be just everyday fears. I have a fear of heights, and occasionally people ask me to climb ladders, and I just find an excuse to not climb the ladder. Occasionally people want me to go on a roof, and I find a reason to not go on the roof. I just don't like heights. It's just an everyday kind of fear. Some people are gripped by a fear of failure. 
or a fear of rejection. Throughout my life, I've watched um, people deal with fear when they hear the doctor say the word cancer. More recent times, the word COVID strikes fear in the hearts of people. The word death strikes fear. It's what scripture calls the last enemy, which is kind of scary. For believers, it's not so much what happens after death, it's just the dying part itself that causes fear. And for many, they are controlled by these fears, whether they're just the small everyday fears or some of the bigger ones. And when I say they're controlled by it, there's just this constant sense of anxiety of that is that we're sizing up the threats around us all the time. We're sizing up our world and we're looking at what's going on. And a lot of times we're reading the headlines or listening to the pundits on the news for the purpose of sizing up the threats. We're looking for that comfort or well-being might um, dash our hopes in some way, and we're looking at them saying, how big are these potential problems? We're looking for some kind of refuge from that. It's just an instinctive thing. We want an escape from those threats. Nobody has to tell us to do this. This is just something that's part of us instinctively from a very young age. Depending on which threat seems bigger, moment to moment, we can find ourselves being overwhelmed and feeling like, I mean, you, you have your first fear that starts out and you think, oh, that's a little troubling. And then as you keep looking and sizing up the fears and they just continue to get bigger and bigger, your sense of security and safety and refuge and your sight can start to diminish and shrink, and you can find yourself being overwhelmed by the fear. And that's when anxiety sets in, worry takes over, and you find yourself in despair. Sometimes we escape this. Sometimes the world around us just seems peaceful and calm, and everything seems to be going our way. Circumstances seem good. But because we're conditioned to search for, for fears and to size them up, even in those moments where things are going good, we find ourselves having challenge or difficulty to really relax and enjoy the peace of that moment because we're thinking, this really can't last that long. There's got to be some other threat on the horizon that I should be looking for, worrying about. This afternoon I was out with a coworker and we were looking at a house with a really steep metal roof. And as we were about to pull away, he, uh, he said, hey, Tony, we stop for a minute and tell me what that is up there on that roof. And it was way up there in the air and there was snow on part of it because we were at a pretty high elevation. I've seen before that at the bottom of the roof, there were the bars that uh, sat up about four or five inches from the rest of the roof line that ran all the way across the bottom part of this metal roof. And I said, I don't know, perhaps the guy who owns this house had those installed in case he ever had to go up on the roof for a reason that was just his last ditch effort to catch himself on the way down. We look for handles in life. We are always looking for the handles. We want help. We see something that might cause us fear and we're looking for the safety bar the stability. This is where Psalm 91 is so helpful because God wants us or God wants to help us as we're sizing up the world to have the correct perspective. He wants you to size up the world and all of its potential fears accurately. I believe Psalm 91 was divinely intended to help us see the world and all of its potential troubles appropriately. So let's just read it. Psalm 91, I'm going to read the whole thing here, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This chapter just gets right at the main point, right out of the gate. It's not a long building, developing argument, a long winded presentation. We see some of those approaches in other places in the Bible, maybe the book of Job would come to mind, or Hebrews, even Romans, where at times it seems like the big ideas kind of held back and it builds and it builds and it builds towards the big idea and then just at the right moment the big idea is presented that's not how this psalm is set up right from the beginning the psalmist tells us this you are safe speaking to the child of God who's sizing up all the things happening in the world, wondering which one should I be terrified of, which one should I be most worried about. Psalm 91, right out of the gate, says to the child of God, you are safe. And he tells us why. And the why here has everything to do with who's keeping us safe, everything to do with who our God is. And so this is the first thing that happens. This is the first thing that God does to, to ground us, to give us some sense of ongoing security that helps fight against our fears, helps us to overcome anxiety and worry. We aren't even into verse 2 as we go through this psalm when we are confronted by our deliverer. Read verse 1 with me again. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so God is confronting fears in the life of a believer. And his first approach to confronting our fears is to say, consider how big I am. He's saying, while you're sizing up the universe... Note the size of the one who created the universe. I'm the Most High. I am God Almighty. And the Most High God. The descriptions here in this passage speak to those who are consumed and surrounded by people in a world that's full of fear. And the description of God used right here, right from the beginning, has a purpose. And the purpose is this. Understand how big God is. 
Consider how it starts to be framed up here. Consider the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and that's a pretty earthy kind of image. It's pretty easy to grasp and to understand. I don't really know any farmers. Occasionally I find myself driving around places in the county where I see some cattle and sometimes I stop and look at them for a minute just because they're kind of interesting creatures. I know some people that I've met out around those kind of places in the county that have five, maybe ten cows on one or two small hills. But look at how God's described. The one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. This very earthy image. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he says, every beast of the forest belongs to me. Every beast of the forest is mine. And this is an image that we can track with. We know what this picture means. Eyes, the scale, proper word might be the immensity of God. It says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. That's another image that's helpful to us. Heavens and props his feet up on the earth. It's another place where God's saying, consider my size. Psalm 91, verse 4. This is strange. God's portrayed here as a, a bird. But look at how this bird's described. This is a bird with wings, and he stretches out his wings, and he covers his little ones. It's God saying, I cover and I protect my children the way that a bird would stretch out its wings to protect its little ones from any dangers or even just the elements outside. And so this is how God's being pictured here in these very earthy ways, concrete ways where we can say, okay, I get that picture and I understand what I'm supposed to take away from that. These are compelling images here. In verse 4 of Psalm 91, it speaks of God as a shield and a buckler. Sometimes the shield, sometimes the buckler. They're con contrasted with one another. The shield, it would be this sense that we have this massive piece of iron or metal that maybe two or three soldiers would take refuge behind. Something that would be very hard for us to just carry around and move. But we would find protection behind it. The buckler was this thing that you would strap around your arm or your, your hand for attack. It's an instrument of mobility. And so we have these two contrasting images here, but they're very easy to understand. It says this, God will protect you. And if you're backed up against the wall, you're being assaulted on every side, God is your shield. But also, God will help you to advance in the cause of the kingdom. God is like your buckler. He can, you can take him on the move with you. He can go with you. He can go before you. He can keep you safe. There's this kind of comprehensive protection package being offered here. Notice how throughout the chapter, God is being sized up against our... He's being sized up against all of the greatest threats that could have come to mind in the ancient world. In verse 3, it's God against the traps of the enemy and deadly pestilence. It says, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. In verses 5 and 6, it's God against the things that terrorize both night and day. It says, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. In verse 7, it's God against a thousand on your left and ten thousand on your right. It says a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Then in verse 10, it's God against all evil. God against all plagues. This certainly would have been on the list 
for people in the ancient world, the top things to be afraid of, pestilence, plagues. And here in verse 10, it says, God's against these things. It says, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. And then in verse 11 and 12, it's God against the natural laws of physics on their hands. And then in verse 12, it says, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. This is very familiar wording as you read through the New Testament and you get to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 tells the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness and Satan comes to Jesus with this passage from Psalm 91. And he's challenging Jesus and he's saying, if you are really the son of God, it should be really easy for you to prove it. Because if you're really the son of God, he's not going to just sit here and watch you fall. He will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And so he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, and he basically says to Jesus, go ahead, show us who you are. Hop off. Just jump off. Prove that God is your father. He certainly won't just sit and watch as you collide with the rocks. You're his dear son. Show us. Take the leap. Show us that you trust your father. He's saying to Jesus, it's written in the word, right? And obviously we know the story. Jesus doesn't jump and he takes great issue with this really poor and superficial interpretation in the selfish application of Psalm 91. But there's another context here in verse 13. God against the lion and the adder. So on the lion and to take note of this pattern that's being formed here as this just continues on. Here's the pattern. God is winning every time. Left, right, center. Whatever the greatest threats are that they could think up in the ancient world, God is dominating all of them. Every contest that man could imagine, God's saying, I'll win that one. The four dangers that are listed in verses 5 and 6, most scholars consider them to be the comprehensive list of the perils of life. Look again at verses 5 and 6. It says, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. It seems these terms throughout the psalm are really kind of playing a double duty. They may very well refer to God's protection from pestilence and from lions, which were part of what it was to be worried about in that part of the world during ancient times. Maybe I would still be worried of cobras if I, about cobras if I lived over there. But these images are pulling double duty here because it's also referring to these great threats that top the list that would come to mind if people were saying, um, I'm afraid of the armies. I'm afraid of lions and adders and the elements. I'm afraid of pestilence and plagues. I'm afraid of anything that could take me out, could wipe me out or kill me. And God's saying, I win over all of those. I'm bigger and greater than all of those. And so what do we do with this in terms of personal application? If the point of this passage is to help us to see things appropriately in terms of their size, to size up the most paralyzing fears, you know, uh, not just of the ancient world, but the most paralyzing fears of the world today, and ask the question, how do those compare to the sovereign, holy, living God, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. As we're reading this and we're questioning, what are the things that I'm tempted to fear? What are the things that cause me to be anxious? This question should rise up as we read this. Is God not able? Is God not able? 
to overcome that thing? Is God not able to protect me or to sustain me? And we can take this all the way to the end. We've been talking a lot about the timeline of our lives compared with the timeline of eternity. At some point, whether we want it to happen or not, at some point we all have an appointment with death. Then the judgment. So that's kind of the last fear, Scripture describes it. But what we've been told is God is bigger than death. God has overcome death in the resurrection of the Son. And so we don't even really have to fear that. Is God not able to even overcome what would be the most terrifying thing? Death itself. I mean, list your fears. This psalm is meant to have an effect on you as you consider your fears. And God is saying to us in this psalm, go ahead, give me your list. Go down your mental checklist of all the things that you might consider worrisome, from the small thing to the greatest thing. Really look at its size and then consider it against the one who sits in the heavens and uses the earth as his footstool. It's God saying, let me show you that I am God Almighty. I am God the Most High. And this is supposed to have an emotional impact on us. This is also supposed to have a very practical impact on us in terms of how we process what's going on in our world. This passage envisions this comprehensive protection in a world full of fear and full of danger. I love verses 5 and 6 because it's terror by night, arrow by day, pestilence in the dark, destruction at noonday, basically saying, basically God saying, hey, in the morning when you wake up and you're tempted to fear, I got you. As you're going about your day, all throughout your day, I've got you. At night, you're mine. I've got you. Well, what's that leave, Lord? Is there another time slot where you might be off duty and it's God saying, no, whether it's morning, day, or night, I'm your God. I'm the most high. I'm in control. I love you. I'll be a shield around you. I'll protect my people. And I think that a principle that's here in Psalm 91 is this. Our fears need to be sized up against our help. And when that's done, we will see our help is bigger. You can take your whole list of fears, the accumulated size of all of them combined. Our help is still And what's strange is this passage isn't meant really to make our fears look small. I mean, when we read through this list of problems that existed in the ancient world and we see them for what they are, it doesn't make the fears look small. The animals that represent the great fears, these aren't chipmunks, squirrels, little cute rabbits. They're lions and they're cobras. And I guarantee you, if a cobra took off down the aisle, everybody in that grove would just take off running for the exit. If a lion came in here roaring, we'd all be heading out the side door. It's a real thing to fear. They're impressive. They're scary. Think about if a thousand people lined up on our left, or my left right now, and wanted to take us out, and we turned to go to the right, and there were 10,000 over there. That's not small. That's a real problem. As we read through Psalm 91, we read through this list, it's not dismissive of these challenges or not dismissive of the size of these potential threats or enemies or adversaries. It's not important for the psalmist to try and diminish the size of them. Why? Because we can be honest about the size of these threats and still say, as big as they are, our God is much bigger. Our help is much bigger. He's God the Most High. He is God Almighty. 
you ever wonder, like, you know, why would do not fear be the most frequent command in Scripture? doesn't seem to me that God says anything by way of command more often than he says to his children, don't fear. Do not fear. Put that together, though, with what the Bible says about wisdom. The first lesson of biblical wisdom is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if we could go back and sit down with the ancients and we'd say, hey, teach me theology. Teach me theology 101. They'd probably start here and say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we have this question, how can both of these things be true? If God's commanding us more than any other command, do not be afraid, do not fear. Yet basic theology starts with this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. My answer is that God has set us free from a world full of fears by giving us a greater fear. A bigger fear. There's a fascinating statement in Luke chapter 12. It's kind of this uh, mini sermon from Jesus. There's a few main points here. Chapter 12, this is Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 4. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear. There we go. Well, what is it I'm not going to fear? Those who will cure, kill the body, and after that, have nothing more they can do. But I warn you, whom to fear? Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Sometimes we look at the disciples when Jesus is teaching, and we kind of laugh at how confused they are. I'm going to be totally honest with you. If I would have been sitting there with them when this sermon was delivered, I would have had some questions. I would have been twisted all around in my head and I would have been confused and I would have wanted more information because look at this. He's saying, don't fear, fear, don't fear. Would spin me around a bit. Seems like a confusing sermon. Look at point number one. Do not fear your persecutors. They're a small threat. Fear God. He's the bigger threat. He's a big threat. Then in verse 3, God cares about you. He's taking care of you. He loves you. He puts more value on you than many sparrows. Don't fear God. Don't fear, fear, don't fear. On one hand, we look at it and say, that just doesn't make any sense. But what he's doing there at the beginning is he's saying, I want to set you free from a world of fears by explaining to you in light of who God is and what he can do, they're nothing. The whole world of fears is nothing. That's a bigger threat. That's a bigger thing to fear because he's the one with authority to cast you into hell. He's saying, I'm going to free you from a world of fears by giving you something greater to fear. He's saying that will drive out the fears of this world. We learn from Jesus in this sermon that God is very personal. Jesus says he cares for the sparrows and he cares for you much more than the sparrows. You don't need to fear. Then that greatest fear, he's the one with authority to throw into hell. But he knows I'm speaking to disciples. I'm speaking to those who believe. I'm speaking to those who are in the Lord. He's saying he cares for you. And so the greatest fear in all the world that you would spend eternity in hell 
You don't have to fear that any longer if you're in the Lord who loves you and he's your heavenly father. And so you're released from that fear. And that's amazing. Psalm 91 views God the same way. If we go back to Psalm 91, God's not just viewed as powerful. He is viewed as personal. In verse 2, the psalmist says, um, this is the turns the first person it says i will say to the lord my refuge and then see how personal this becomes my fortress my god in whom i trust my fortress my god in whom i trust this really personal connection brings us to the second element that's highlighted in this passage So we encounter first the strength of our deliverer, the size of our deliverer. But the next thing that we see is the kind of people that he delivers. I'm going to make sure I have time to go another location. I'll just scratch the surface on it. If you go to Acts chapter 9 and you see Jesus confronting Saul, we won't read through this tonight just for the sake of time. Jesus doesn't say to, if you know this story, Jesus doesn't say to Saul, why are you persecuting other Christians? Why are you persecuting your fellow men? Paul, I want you to rise above this. That's not what he says at all. He stops him and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This is not Jesus merely empathizing with those that are being oppressed, Paul's potential victims. This is Jesus saying, You're persecuting me. I identify with my people. They're mine. You are persecuting me. I take this personally. You are attacking me. This is another way of Jesus saying, I am with my people. Back in Psalm 91, we see the protected people of God described in a few different ways. Verse 1 says, they dwell. There's this active dwelling. Remember what Jesus told his disciples, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can't do anything. The New Testament talks a lot about the idea of us being united to Jesus, Christ in us, us in him. And Jesus was teaching them, join to me, you have life, you have protection, you have my righteousness, you have salvation from God. He is our wisdom from God. All of this is from him, abiding and dwelling in our Savior. The New Testament tells us this happens because we're joined to him by faith. Trust in him through the Holy Spirit. We're trusting in his death on the cross that covers our sins. We're trusting his resurrection that means Lord forever, where united to him. He becomes our refuge. He becomes a mighty fortress. Nothing else is necessary. We don't need to do anything else to enhance it. We receive these things through faith in Christ, trusting. And the psalmist announces this kind of trust. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And this is the gospel. You know the fear of facing a holy God may not make the top list of people's fears right now. But there is coming a day when that will rise immediately to the top of everyone's list. The fear of facing a holy God without a refuge or shelter. And this is the wonder of the gospel that God Almighty, the Lord Most High, God, the God of holiness, of absolute purity and righteousness, the one whom we ought to fear more than anything else on the list has told us, I've provided for you a refuge. 
I've given you a shield. He's told us through the gospel, I have protected you and will protect you from just wrath against your sin. God in his mercy, when he sent Jesus, said, I'm sending you a shield. Hide in him. He didn't say, I'm not going to pour out my wrath. He's going to pour out his wrath. He can't deny his own righteousness. But he's saying, I'm sending you salvation. I'm sending you a shield. Hide in Christ. He's saying, I provided sinners a shelter. The one who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91 is telling us what the gospel tells us. Believe in him. Abide in him. Dwell in him. Fear nothing. We have so many things in the world that could cause us to be overcome with fear, especially in light of recent events in the world and just how much things have changed in the last 12 months. Those are big challenges. If we just start making a list of all the things that might worry us, it can look like a pretty terrifying list. I would tell you this psalm is meant to tell us not that those things are small, not that they're insignificant, but the psalm is meant to remind us our help is always bigger. God Most High, the Lord Almighty, the one who sits down in heaven and makes the earth his footstool, has said, I provide a shield. I provide protection. I provide refuge for my people. Believe it. Believe in him. Trust in him. Abide in him. Lord, our ever-present help ever-present help, present in the morning, at noonday, at night. You don't punch out at a certain time every day. Lord, you are always with us. Our shield, our salvation, our protection. Lord, help us to have the right perspective. You are greater than any problem this world can throw at us. Help us to not fear. Help us to not be open. As you release us from fears and worries of this world, empower us and strengthen us by your spirit to live at all times with peace and joy. Even in the midst of hardship or suffering or persecution that may come, that we would have peace and joy knowing that, Lord, you sustain us through us through it all. You are bigger than any temporary problem. Lord, I know that there are people in just my circle of friends, and I'm sure there's people that are part of our church body here at Faith Family right now who have experienced great difficulty in the last several months. Things that they wouldn't have imagined just a year ago that we've walked through. We see in the story of Job, the attack came like curse God and die, and so often the enemy comes at night. We see the opposite is true, that even in the midst of these troubling times and real problems, big problems, God, you are greater And you constantly call your people through your word to trust in you, to abide in you, to dwell in you. The most high God where we find refuge, protection, and strength. And so I pray for the people at Faith Family, God, as they've gone through these times, as maybe they're still experiencing these times, that tonight as we consider this word, that they are turning to you with trust and the hope and seeing your greatness, seeing that our help is bigger than our problems. And that...
worry and anxiety as they again renew that trust in the one who is our ever-present help. We thank you that that is true. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.